class is now in session. I am Professor Hockey, and today we're discussing game 56 of the regular season between the San Jose Sharks and the Vegas Golden Knights, in which the Sharks have lost 2 to 1. Uh, ever since the Golden Knights came into the league in the 17 18 season, these teams have had some sort of rivalry there. It, it was certainly supported by the fact that the Sharks and the Golden Knights met in the playoffs two years in a row in 18, uh, in 17 18 and in 18 19, where of course the legendary Game 7 occurred. Now, as of late, this rivalry has kind of fallen off due to the fact that the San Jose Sharks haven't made the playoffs in multiple years now, but there is still some bad blood between the two teams. However, However, it has been the Golden Knights in the majority of the regular season games played between these two clubs that have actually come out on top, and tonight ended up not being any different. The Sharks would lose this one in regulation 2-1, but this was a pretty interesting game with a couple of pretty interesting factors. So let's start off in the first period where on paper it looks relatively even. Yes, the Golden Knights did outshoot the Sharks, but they had three total power plays, so that is to be expected, but when you look a bit deeper into this one, this was probably one of the worst periods that the Sharks have played this season. It was really, really bad. Sometimes when you take three penalties, it's kind of the reason why your period was bad. Oh, you can't get any momentum established. You can't really roll all of the lines, and so because the officials got in the way and called three bogus penalties or something like that, you ended up playing a bad period. But in fact, it's kind of the opposite. The Sharks were playing so poorly that they end up taking three penalties because of that. And they're honestly very lucky to have even escaped that first period in a tie game. Capo Kakinen absolutely stood on his head not only in the first 20 minutes, but in pretty much all 60 minutes of this game. In the second period, the Sharks would pick things up and actually start playing decently well, getting some shots on net. The Golden Knights would continue to rack up power plays, but it would be the Sharks who would strike first with a goal from Barabanov as he remained hot with his 10th goal of the season. And as such, it was actually a Sharks lead. 40 minutes into this one. However, going into the third period, there was the statistic that with the Sharks having a lead, they have been very good at closing out games or at the very least getting a singular point. In fact, the only have one regulation loss when leading after two periods. The problem was is that that one regulation loss came back in October against this very same Vegas Golden Knights team, and as the hockey gods do, it ends up repeating itself. The Golden Knights would end up tying this game with a goal from Cotter to make it 1-1, and then in the last 17 seconds, the Sharks would just have a complete breakdown on their coverage off the faceoff. The Golden Knights would win the draw. They'd take a shot. It would go far wide wide, but a very hard shot comes right off the backboards, and it seemed as though it completely fooled and just handcuffed both Benning and Nick Bonino, and as such, they both left William Carrier unattended at the side of the net, an easy tap-in goal for him. Kakinen, who had been so spectacular throughout the game, had no chance on this goal, and unfortunately, the Sharks would end up losing the game 2-1. to one. On to the players to talk about. We have Benino, Hertel, and Meyer as the first line, but this first line did not last after the first period in which it did pretty much nothing. David Quinn made an absolute crazy move, something that I would have never had the guts to do. I don't think any possible coach would have ever thought to do such a bold and courageous and incredible coaching maneuver here. He decided to put the 25-point Kevin LeBanc, who has already played like half of the season with these two players and was inexplicably healthy scratched because I actually have no idea. He decides to reunite Hurdle and Meyer with Kevin LeBanc, and it immediately pays dividends, not on the score sheet, but they were certainly much better than they were in the early parts of this game. In fact, in the third period, this was the line generating the vast majority of the chances, and what's very interesting is that while, of course, I look at like Timo Meyer and he had a solid game once that line was reunited, I felt as though the best player on this line was actually Kevin LeBanc, who looked really, really good. He did pretty much everything besides score this goal and in fact he was actually quite good early on in this game even when on the fourth line kind of similar to how I thought he was last game where he got no reward for his performance this 
game tonight. He does get the reward. He moves up to that top line and he even ends up getting like some six on five time with the goaltender pulled in those last few seconds of this game. So clearly, David Quinn, he liked what he saw. He makes the incredibly crazy, courageous move of reuniting that top line and not having like Nick Bonino or Noah Gregor on the top line for absolutely zero reason. And hopefully this is something that can continue when LeBanc won't randomly return to the press box because of one off game. Moving on to the second line, we have Barabanov, Couture, and AC Mont. Like I said, Barabanov did indeed remain hot with his goal, the only goal of the night here for the San Jose Sharks. Uh, I thought this generally the second line was okay bit of a rough start like the rest of the team never necessarily had the high highs of that top line in particular Kevin LeBanc but they did get some decent chances AC Mont had a couple of decent looks Couture had a good look Barabanov like I mentioned did score so I thought the second line was pretty good all things considered then we have the third line. The player to talk about here is actually Nico Sturm because relatively early on in this game, he actually blocks a shot to the midsection and ends up leaving the game, heading to the dressing room. And it seemed as though his night was done. He was questionable to return. And usually questionable to return means a player isn't coming back. But he actually ends up coming back for a few shifts in the second period. He doesn't end up playing much ice time at all. And he couldn't even take face-offs due to to this blocked shot early on. Benino ended up taking those face off and Storm only had about seven minutes of ice time, but pretty courageous that he was even able to return. Having said that, once Benino was moved down from that first line due to Kevin LeBanc jumping up and playing with, you know, Gregor and Lindblom, honestly, it was not particularly effective as a line. There were a couple of chances, as are the usual with a Gregor line where they had like an odd man rush in this game. I don't think they were terrible, as in they were always, you know, giving up the puck defensively and just being completely awful and a liability. I just don't think they really did much at all either, so kind of a, a wash type of line. And the fourth line was relatively similar. They obviously had a pretty decent start when Kevin LeBanc was on that line. I thought Sveshnikov, Lorenz, and LeBanc as a trio was decently solid early on in this game, but once LeBanc was gone and then sort of like Sturm summon people double shifting these guys getting like the occasional shift they really didn't have much ice time either it was a situation where they were more or less invisible but it's hard to necessarily blame them because they didn't really have much of a line in this game past like the 10 minute mark of the first period on to the defensive side of things so uh definitely some pretty interesting things going on with this first pairing so uh, Harrington ends up getting benched which was somewhat of a surprise he has been the consistent partner of Eric Carlson ever since the Jacob Megna trade from a couple of weeks back and I thought Harrington had been doing a decent job in that role not amazing not blowing me away I don't think he does it was like uh, this is like a travesty that he ends up getting benched but it was somewhat of a, of a surprise and if you had asked me earlier today which of the other five defensemen for the San Jose Sharks I wouldn't want to see on a pairing with Eric Carlson, I would have said Jacob McDonald because Carlson, ever since he's been in San Jose, he's been pretty much entirely paired with defense-first players. Vlasic, Middleton, Magna, Ferraro... All of these types of guys are defense first. They'll cover for any sort of mistake or even just jumping up in the play that Eric Carlson would do. McDonald, ever since he's been here with the Sharks, hasn't really struck me as that type of defenseman. He struck me as a pretty offense first kind of guy. So it was very weird to see these two players paired together, and we saw why it's kind of an awkward match on this first Vegas goal. Uh, the Sharks enter the zone, it's Carlson, LeBanc, and... Uh and Meyer, and it is Hurdle and McDonald trailing behind, but instead of McDonald playing it safe, he tries to jump up in the play here, and he ends up giving the puck away. Hurdle is not prepared for the sudden change in possession. He falls over and ends up being a two-on-one the other way, and it leads to this Vegas game tying goal so it was a bit strange to see the pairing I don't think McDonald was actually particularly good here tonight I don't think he was terrible but I don't think he was particularly good so it just seems like a very odd benching and yet he ends up with like 21 minutes of ice time I think he actually gets a good amount of penalty killing time in a game in which the Sharks had a solid penalty kill though I think Vegas really struggled and of course Kaknan was superb who I will get to a bit later but it was just an odd choice it felt like when 
it comes to the second defensive pairing of Vlasic and Benning, I thought this was by far the Sharks' best defensive pairing of the night, at least on the defensive side of things, doing some really solid jobs. It really just continues the kind of renaissance year that Vlasic has had, certainly not at the insane defensive levels that he was at in like the 2013, 2014, those types of years, but he's definitely much better than he has been these past two years. I mean, last year, he was essentially like a seventh defenseman who I wanted healthy scratched multiple times times and yet for whatever reason wasn't getting healthy scratch and now this season he's like the Sharks third if not second best defenseman kind of tied there with Matt Benning and so it's actually been quite solid he's even putting up like a few points here or there which is nice to see so generally a solid game from this second line or this second pairing from the San Jose Sharks and then finally on the third pairing we do have Nick Chichek coming in for Harrington like I said this was a big surprise because I don't think Chichek necessarily deserves to play games and Chichek was kind of eh I mean right now he's on a pairing with Mario Ferraro who is unfortunately in a situation where Ferraro kind of drags down his defensive partner with his not so good play so I think Chichek kind of ended up in a situation like that so this third pairing was kind of subpar but finally we get to the goaltender for the San Jose Sharks Capo Kakinen who has just been absolutely superb in his last few outings he's been really really good as of late and here tonight was just like the peak of that Kakinen seems to be almost unbeatable here tonight if he was not in nets if he was playing average the Sharks probably get absolutely destroyed like 6-1 6-1 or something like that just in the third period on that and that Golden Knights seventh power play of the game he makes an insane toe save on William Carlson who already had his hands up in the air celebrating a goal before he realized he was completely robbed by Kakinen and then literally just like five seconds later the Golden Knights get another amazing chance and it is Kakinen with the insane glove save a few minutes later after that it is Shea Theodore completely left all alone with all the time in the world and Kakinen goes for like the scorpion blocker type of save to prevent him from getting that goal and unfortunately at the end of the day Kakinen will be given the L here and in the record books you'll look back and you'll say oh Kakinen lost this game just as he lost so many other games in this particular season but he's been absolutely turning it around over these past few games I don't want to take full credit for this but I will mention that after this has been since I gave him the F in my mid-season grade so I'm sure he watched that video and said you know what I gotta prove Professor Hockey wrong I gotta pick up my game and he has done that absolutely positively a fantastic performance likely his best of the season even though he's had you know wins he's had shutouts nothing really compares to this insane outing of his but that will do it for this review the Sharks will be back in action on Saturday and they have been playing pretty decent hockey as of late even if the losses have sort of continued to rack up and that's kind of like that perfect zone that you want to see the San Jose Sharks in because If they were actually getting a lot of these wins in games that they've played pretty well in, they'd probably not be in a playoff spot still, and they'd be in a bad spot of like uh, 12th last in the league where they don't get necessarily a great draft pick, but they still don't make the playoffs, and so it's just kind of a wash of a year. So the fact that the Sharks have managed to give us some interesting games as of late while still like losing them and finding themselves fourth last in the league is actually kind of a sweet spot, so we'll see how it continues forward class dismissed.